Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop. How's everybody doing out there? Of course, if I could hear you, you could tell me. But anyway. You can type in the comments. Yeah, well, you can do that. Absolutely. Our guest this week, we're going to talk about dialects and a few other fun things, too. Our guest is PJ Auckland. PJ, how you doing? I'm well. How are you, Dan? We're doing great. So uh, if you got any questions for PJ about dialects and all this stuff that is really important to learn if you're a voice actor, put it in the chat room. And maybe as we talk, you'll have a question based on something we're talking about, and we will get to that in the next segment. So stay tuned. You ready, George? I'm ready as ever. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop right now. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan's signature products. Source Elements, the folks who bring you Source Connect. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. VoiceActor.com, your voiceover website ready in minutes. VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success. And by World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Hey, how's it going out there? I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. Well, I keep forgetting that tomorrow night is Halloween, depending on what time you're watching this. So it if feels you're watching like the replay, when, when Halloween's on a Tuesday, it's like it's been done already. Right. I mean, it's it goes, all the partying happened. There was tons of people in the streets. Culver City, I just was riding through there on Sunday at five and it was full of kids. Yeah. So they, they, they already, it's been, it's been done already. <laughs> yes. We've been told that we have one bag of candy less than what we should. So now we got to go buy What's another bag. It, it means that how, somebody said, oh, yeah, we usually go through this many bags of candy on Halloween. Really? You know, how many do you have? Well, we got, oh, you're going to need more than that. <laughs> we, <laughs> okay. I mean, we, we've been doing it for, you know, we've been here for eight years. It's Halloween you every year. must have year. printed more kids or either they're, more, or they're greedier. I know. And, peop, and people just decorate their places like crazy. Like my, na- <laughs> my neighbor with the graveyard. Yeah, your, your and, neighbor really yeah. goes, goes off, goes off. Yeah, all we do is take a lemon and write boo on it, and it's sort of like hanging there. <laughs> and that's, that's Halloween for us. Anyway, I hope you're all enjoying your Halloween or had a great Halloween, depending on when, when you're watching this. Right. Tonight, we have a great guest because we want to talk about dialects. And the number one guy in town who can do that is award-winning actor and producer and coach P.J. Auckland. He's been working in the entertainment industry for nearly 40 years. PJ is best known behind the microphone as the widely acclaimed and record-setting audiobook narrator of more than 500 titles. And PJ is also one of the industry's leading dialect and performance coaches. He's founder of Dr. Dialect, which is www.drdialect.com, co-founder of the Diane Institute of Voice Artistry in Los Angeles and teaches from coast to coast at conferences and universities. And PJ is the official dialect coach for Universal Studios and the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. So he's one of the only people on the planet who actually teaches at Hogwarts. Let's welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop, PJ Auckland. PJ, how you doing? Hello again. Hey, great to see you. How do I get one of those boo lemons? Oh, just come on over. I'll just... Okay, great. Awesome. I want to make a note. I've got to stop by because that's... It just, that's yeah, that's a treat just, I want to get my hands on. Yeah, it's like, all right, just write boo on it. It'll, yeah. it'll be fine. Someone will see it. Anyway, uh, welcome to the show again. You know, ac- accents are, are a really tough thing, and we'll we'll get into talking about that in a second. But as, as the introduction said, you wear a lot of hats, doing a hmm. lot of different things. How do you handle all that? I, I assume you don't do it all at exactly the same time. There's some crossover, you know, but uh, but no, generally speaking, it's 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 sort of like divided into three things: the the acting, and I'll lump the voice acting in with that, the producing, and the coaching. And no, I just somehow make it work. You know, I'm not nowadays. I'm uh, I'm doing a lot more of the producing and coaching 
um, you know, with the the pandemic time and with the strike and everything else, the on camera stuff is quieter than it's been in decades past. So that's not taking up as much time as it has. And then VO wise, I'm doing at least 90% of my work is uh, is in audiobooks. And you can kind of write your own schedule with audiobooks. The vast majority is self-recorded, self-engineered, self-directed in my right. home studio. So you can kind of make that work. And then the producing, it's not passive, obviously. Um, you're still participating in every project you're producing, but it's not that direct one-to-one -one every minute of the project. It's you in the booth the way it is with narrating. So somehow it all works and it's good. It keeps me keeps me on my toes. Yeah. What sort of voiceover projects are you working on right now that you can tell us about? I'm working on uh, today. In fact, I was in the booth doing the follow up to a really popular Japanese detective mystery series that I do. And um, this Roman, um, these adventure stories, uh, fictional, but they incorporate a lot of Roman history into these stories of these Roman legionaries and uh uh, just a, a ton of things, mostly, again, mostly the audiobooks, but across all different genres. Um, my wife's series, which is my favorite thing that I do, hands down. And yes, obviously, I'm biased, but they really are amazing. Uh, that's a, uh, a YA fantasy series that are just a blast to uh, to record. So there's always something keeping me keeping me on my toes in the booth. Yeah. So do, do, when you do something Roman, do you do it in a British accent the way every every Roman movie I ever watched? It's so is. funny you should say that. As a, <laughs> as a matter of fact. As we've often joked sometimes, especially as Americans, you know, Brits don't do this. Brits don't take on American accents when they're playing, you know, ancient Romans because it's different from our <laughs> being. Right. Like, but we do that for whatever reason. It just sounds right. And the audience buys in. Uh, accent choices don't always necessarily, they're not always informed by reality and history, but we go with maybe what the audience expects and what makes for hopefully the best listening experience. And for some reason, British RP for ancient Rome just works. Yeah. It's Shakespearean. That's why. Yeah. Uh, Maybe that's what it is. But uh, yeah, I, that always strikes me. As, what, did they all speak with British accents in, in ancient Rome? I, and of course, they were all speaking English, too. Of so. course. Exactly. You know, because <laughs> nobody can speak Latin. There you go. I mean, what, be, what, go what do you do when a book lands on, on, your, on your desk that you know is going to be I don't know. How how far have you gotten into a book where you realize I shouldn't have picked this book? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> like, you know, what do you do when that happens? It's got to happen once in a while. Unless, unless it's some crazy, like, like you're absolutely wrong casting for a variety of reasons, you know? Uh, that could be, like, background or, or even gender. You know, uh, there have been situations where I've said to a publisher, do you, this is written in, like, third-person limited perspective, but it's they might have just glanced at it and you realize it's third person limited, limited to the POV of like the female lead of the book. Like this should totally be her book. You know what I mean? So you get situations like that occasionally and you'll go back and say, this was a, I don't know if you guys noticed this and they'll say, Oh, thanks for pointing it out, you know, and recast and bring it to their attention. But when it comes to like accents or characters, unless I feel like I'm wildly miscast, it's a challenge, you know, you take it on. And even if it's something you haven't done before, I guess I've always been known a little bit for my versatility, so that doesn't really happen too much. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the casting directors and the producers responsible for the books, they have a clue, you know, so they're they're looking at the book and unless something has slipped through the cracks, they're picking you for a reason, you know, and uh, something mm -hmm. that it falls within your range or something you've done before, or maybe you have a little bit of a fan base in that particular genre, who knows, but um, lots of different factors. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a question for PJ Auckland about dialects, which I'm sure everybody is fascinated with, put it in the chat room because I know that uh, Jeff Holman is sitting back there somewhere uh, typing out every word that we say here, uh, or at least he's taking your questions and we'll get to those questions in a little bit. All you have to do is if uh, whether you're on Facebook Live or whether you're on our website, uh, in YouTube, or even on LinkedIn, we're everywhere live which means the entire world is watching. Uh, just put it in the chat room where you are, and Jeff will get that question to us in a little bit. So we, we'd we really like it if you if you ask some questions and get involved and interactive with our show. So trying different dialects isn't for everyone, but should everyone try? Well, I, sure. I mean, are we talking about voice actors? Yes, of course. And sure, yeah. I mean, trying... 
it, it, I guess it depends. It comes down to, yes, there's some innate talent, but you can learn things, as I'm sure your audience is well aware of. There's coaching available in every aspect of this industry, as you both specialize in, in your areas. Um, dialect's no different, you know, and there are techniques you can use to take on these skills to acquire them over time. It helps to have an ear, obviously, to come to the table with some innate talent that's factory installed. But even if you don't, you can learn techniques that will help you improve. And then it, what you have to ask yourself, I believe, then is what are the requirements of the job? Right. Like take audiobooks. Audiobooks are a great example. The listener, I say this all the time, the listener is in on the conceit. You know, they sign up for the idea that it's one narrator playing the entire cast right. and you want them to become immersed in that. But at no point do you have to convince the listener that you stepped out of the booth and some German dude stepped in to read that dialogue? There's still that built in understanding that it's you. So a little bit of flavor goes a long way, right? Absolutely. There's that gray area that you can live within. Whereas if you've been cast as one role in animation, or multiple roles in interactive, like in a video game, and you're hired to play the Russian guy, the German guy, and the Israeli, there is no conceit built in. You have to be 100% convincing in those roles individually, right? right? So that's the distinction. So it really, we have to figure out what's the threshold you need to cross for the job requirements. And with audiobooks, I often teach, I, I developed a thing because an audiobook narrator can find themselves in a unique position where they've been cast in a job and it has some character and accent requirements and they accept the gig. And then they realize, oh boy, the, the publisher or the casting director didn't tell me there's like five different accents in here that I haven't done before. Now in that situation, it's not really practical to hire a dialect coach like me to do five one hour sessions on these five different That's accents right. that you need to start recording four days from now. So what I developed was this program on how to be your own dialect coach. And that's really, really useful, I think, for any VO discipline. But more so when we talk about an audiobook situation like that, where you're playing these five different accents that you need to acquire, again, that concept of a little bit of flavor goes a long way. If you can pick out three or five sound changes and the concept of the placement for those particular accents, that's more than enough to sell the audience on those characters who have those accents. So that's, you know, just to give you an example of like the different, what the different genres or different disciplines of VO might require. I think audiobooks are a good example where you don't have to be a master of the accents to do the job well. And one last thought on that, what I always tell people is who the character is, is always more important than what they sound like. And I think that applies across the board with VO, but especially in that example with audiobooks, understand who they are, tap into their personality, their motivations, the acting one-on-one kind of stuff. And then the accent or the character voice and aspects you bring to it to distinguish them from other characters, that's gravy. Mm -hmm. Once again, we're talking with PJ Auckland and we're talking about dialects. Your questions are welcome as well. So make sure you throw them in the chat room. Uh, here, this is a question I've always wondered because especially in talking about dialects, what's the difference between dialects and accents explain okay <laughs> so the the first easy answer is that they're pretty interchangeable in today's parlance because people talk about a dialect coach is not technically teaching dialects we're teaching accents so the term dialect coach has been used in the entertainment industry for a really long time but we're doing accent coaching the more technical answer is when we get into dialects we're talking about linguistic differences an accent is the sound someone has when they're speaking another language, let's say, the accent that comes with it, or even in their own native language. The accent is the sound. The dialect is the linguistic difference. So, for example, you've got classic Italian versus the Neapolitan dialect, right? So when you see those, they can be, they're also written differently. So sometimes you can have copy your script and we can say it's written in dialect. Uh, you might even see this like with the Scottish accent, for example. If it's written in the dialect, you'll see things like the W-I apostrophe or the N-O apostrophe representing the glottalized T. Um, so you see things like that. That's another example of the definition of dialect. So linguistic differences or a language written into 
um, your actual script written with the dialect, written in dialect. Hope that yeah. answers your question. Well, no, that makes total sense. You know, I'm, you know, I, the thing that I think a lot of people we we sort of talked about this a little bit before, but some people just have an ear for this. Like yeah. you know, I I know I can imitate certain things, and it's mostly every different nationality that lives in my neighborhood. You know, Russians, Latin Americans. Yeah, everything, every, but of course, when you're walking down the street and they're talking in some other language on their phone and it's, you're like, it's kind of okay. weird. Now, was that Russian? Was that Ukrainian? Was that, you know, from Kazakhstan or, you know, or were they talking Chinese like my neighbors do? Um, you know, we hear yelling from across the street, but we can't understand a word they're saying, but they all, the, the dialects and, and those are all so different. I mean, I know I can, I can do an accent someone speaking english in another accent like you know my my old acupuncturist dr wu who would talk real quiet like this no you know or someone who's speaking with an indian accent oh yes anybody can do that one it's very easy to do that uh i'm mixing a little bit of yiddish in there but it's um <laughs> is that is that a remix or a mixer i it might be might be uh you know i I, I'm always listening and I'm always listening to see I, what is different about that. But then again, mm -hmm. everything starts to get a little bit stereotyped when you're working with somebody. How do you get them perhaps out of their preconceived notions of what it is they're supposed to be doing? It's such a good question. Um, the preconceived notions when, since I have the great advantage of working primarily with actors, it's rare, you know, just in my career, there have been a few situations where you work with a business professional who's looking for like accent reduction, things like that. But by and large, 99 plus percent of the people I work with are actors. So their preconceived notions, I think, are largely an advantage. They're bringing something to the table where, OK, let me let me explain it this way. I break down accent work into two buckets. Basically, I say there's the placement bucket and the sound change bucket or phonetics. And I often demonstrate how you can't have one without the other. I'll say each bucket is worth 50%. So the only way the math works is with some combination of the two if you want to get to a passing grade. If this bucket's full, you're at 50, that ain't a passing grade. You need some combination of the two to get there. And that's sort of how I demonstrate placement. So uh, an example I use all the time, I'm happy to share with you now, sure. is let's say we're on set and we've learned a German accent together and they just added a line to the script. And you're freaking out because we didn't work on that specific line. And the line they added is, um, do you have it? Now, right. if we're only working on sound changes, and I look at this line, if the only thing we're doing is respelling the line in the accent, right? Only phonetic changes. I look at this line, there's not a whole lot that we can do there. The long U sound in do and you doesn't change a whole lot. The short I and it, Germans can handle that, doesn't change very much. The one word that's going to change phonetically would be the word have. And I could say, well, a German, generally speaking, and we often work in these generalizations, not stereotypes, but generalizations in terms of most Germans will do this when speaking English. That's what gives us something to latch onto and what ultimately makes it recognizable for the audience member, which is our goal. They know you're doing a German accent. So I'll say they generally will change a short A to a short E and a V to an F. F yeah. So we take this H-A-V phonetically and turn it into H-E-F phonetically. So the new spelling of the line, if I haven't changed anything else, is do you have it with me so far? Yeah. But therein the problem lies because I just said that out loud and it didn't make me sound remotely German. Right. Yeah, but then we start to imagine I start to move the placement of my voice. Yeah. We get to the front of the mouth, the lips and the teeth. And I say, well, do you have it? Do you have it? Well, now I'm sounding German. So this works. This works for the character, and that's good. But let's go a step further. Say, well, this PJ guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I am a diplomat. I speak on the world stage. I know what a V is. Thank you very much. I've been using English my whole life. <laughs> and I say, well, do you have it? Do you have it? Yeah? And I still sound German. So now as I go back to standard American, the thing I want you to notice is the placement shift. In other words, it, even though the example makes it seem like placement trumps phonetics, it doesn't, but they have equal importance. So bringing this back to what I was saying that working with actors, placement is a really tricky thing to teach and learn. I help people with that, obviously, 
but it's something that often gets jumped over or skipped because dialect coaches, especially in the private world, as opposed to working on set with someone and you're there all day or what have you, or working for the duration of a project, if you're doing a one hour session with a dialect coach, placement is a hard thing to get into. So I spent a good amount of my career realizing that's not acceptable and trying to make it more digestible, understandable, comprehensible, and so on. And I think I've succeeded in that. What, what do you mean by, is, place, by, by placement, though? I'll get there. Okay, I'm sorry. The cool thing is actors are coming with this automatic understanding, if you will, most of the time. Like just through mimicry alone, you're leapfrogging a lot of the more esoteric aspects of acquiring placement. So what I, what I mean by placement, Dan, to answer your question is, it's not about where we create sound. It's more where we send it. So you, when I was doing that example with the German, I talked about the lips and the teeth. Mm -hmm. As far forward as we can possibly imagine, the same sort of placement we use for British RP. Those are the two, you could say, most forward accents. Standard American, this is a good tip for everybody. If you want to qu acquire different placement, it's essential to kind of know what your baseline placement is. So if you want to just talk. I recommend you do this. Just talk at a normal level. Say anything that, and just keep, keep talking. It doesn't matter. Don't pay attention to the words you're using. Rather, pay attention to what it feels like in your mouth while you're doing it. So if you're a standard American speaker, more often than not, you're going to feel this ring of vibration in the middle of your mouth. Tongue, jaw, cheek muscles really engaged. Vibration up to the roof of your mouth in like the highest part of the cavern in there right in the middle, that ring right here. I feel that when I'm just talking normally, standard American, and I, I bet you will too, all of you listening in. And that's really good. Once you've acquired that and you understand it, then you can start to play around with your placement and move it. And you go all the way down, like the deepest guttural, most throaty thing is where we would place Russian. And then all the way forward, the other extreme end of the spectrum would be British RP and German. So that's the concept of placement. And you need that. So in that example that I did, it's not that you, it's not that the placement's more important, but you need both and you can really get away. There's a lot more room for error when you have a good understanding of placement, because as I demonstrated, I could ignore the dialect coach's advice about those sound changes and still manage to sound German by holding that placement. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go. Hopefully that answers it. Once again, we're talking with PJ Auckland. We're talking about dialects, which is a, a real important part of voiceover, especially if you're doing audio books or if you're doing audio drama, which is now becoming really important since, yes. you know, podcasting has become the democratization of broadcasting. Everybody can do it. So mm -hmm. let's bring back, you know, the, uh, the theater of the mind and, and doing audio. Have you worked with anybody doing audio drama? Yeah, just did this really, really cool project. I've done quite a few, but just did a really great one with uh, the folks from LA theater works and also uh, Allison Larkin. You might know Allison, mm -hmm. uh, who does some beautiful work. And uh, we put together this very, very cool piece, yet to be released, but uh, uh, we did. It was this amazing thing, uh, Civil War in their own words, and it combined elements of Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And I played Stephen Douglas and a few characters from Uncle Tom's Cabin and others as well, John Brown. Uh, it was really, really cool. Um, but in, in those circumstances, that's where it's different from what we talked about with audiobooks, where the listener is not in on some conceit that it's one narrator doing the whole thing. Now you're back to the idea of like animation or a stage production or a film production. You're cast in those roles. So now the bar is higher. Now you need to be fully convincing in those accents or in those you know character voice portrayals. Right. Right. Once again, we're talking with PJ Auckland. And if you're just joining us, well, you've missed a whole lot already, but you still get the chance to ask your questions in the chat room uh, where Jeff Holman is standing by and taking those down. If this is something fascinating to you and as a voice actor, it really should be. Uh, feel free to ask your questions. How often do you get a chance to talk to somebody like PJ and, and ask the right questions? Now, I, you know, we talked a little bit about technique. I mean, I have my techniques for doing these sorts of things. A lot of it is is mimicking more than anything mm -hmm. else. Uh, and, and sometimes it's, 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 it's talking, you know, gibberish in another language. Like if I want to talk Russian, you know, I love gibberish. Talk. You know, you know, well, you're talking in French. You're talking like that. You know, I found the funniest Frenchmen video that was a, I think it was a Jap, <laughs> no, Italian 
video, like a song yeah. from the Praise 70s. and Holy Names the Name Choose All. Yeah, where they're imitating American accent, <laughs> yeah. but it's all yeah. gibberish. Yeah, it's yeah. Praise and Holy Names the Name Choose All. I, I encourage everybody to look it up. And it's such a catchy song. This goes back to like the 60s. And 60s, um, yeah. yeah, amazing. The video, too, is so good. Priceless. It's remember, so good. Yeah. I remember seeing an interview with Ricardo Montalban once. I think it was on the Tonight Show. And he's like, Why? Well, I grew up in Mexico. And we thought when we heard American TV, it sounded like a dog barking. You know, <laughs> well, it, it doesn't that, sound like that to me. But. If you ever hear that song that George was just talking about, it's great because like the only thing in there that's actually English is at the end of certain lines, they say, all right. <laughs> so it's like this long string of gibberish and it ends in all right. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. It's so brilliant. All righty. Once again, we're talking with PJ Auckland. Um, how do you think AI is going to affect all of this stuff when it comes to the audio world? Uh, can a computer do a dialect or what, what have you seen? What are you seeing coming and, and how do you think it's going to affect the industry? Wow. We go from fluffy questions about dialect work into like the big <laughs> giant herd of elephants in the room. Um, okay. Um, huge topic. Huge. Dropping a bomb, Dan. Um, Okay, can it do it? Amazingly right now, not yet. But I think like anything else in VO, we have to be completely prepared for the fact that it will. That's just, there's just no getting around that. And I think with any, the advent of any technology, especially on a show with a guy named George the Tech, we have to appreciate <laughs> that you're not going to stop the technology. It is coming. So when we get into like these deeper AI conversations, my sort of baseline is always we've got to focus on, in terms of job security, we've got to focus on what we can do that by definition AI can't do. And that's really the focus on the humanity, the soul of the performance, what makes art truly art. That, as I say, is the baseline for me. The next layer to that, while we can't stop the technology, so I'm, no, I'm not much of a fan of just raging against it because I just don't think that'll do any good. But here's the deeper side in where my thoughts have been going lately. I think that the collective power centers, corporations, major producers, this type of thing, the industry at large, decision makers. I think there's a responsibility there to not fully embrace it and understand that key difference. Um, maintaining artistic integrity is such, such a big deal. And there have been situations throughout history where these power centers will start doing something differently and the public is sort of forced to accept it. And um, I was in a conversation with someone recently about this, making this point, and she hadn't thought of it in this way before, but then she brought up a brilliant example, which I'll use with you today. And she said, oh, you mean like architecture? And I said, yeah, exactly. In other words, you have this period in history where so much, so much effort was put into architecture because in this belief that we want to be surrounded by beauty. And in time, that beauty becomes impractical and there's a shift and we start accepting something less than beauty. And this is what I mean where it gets certainly more philosophical, but I think it's a really important point. If, for example, the industry accepts AI in its entirety, in other words, that's the only thing out there that's available unless you're seeking out the underground independent sort of stuff. Your plumber, your mortgage broker, your real estate agent, they don't suddenly go out and start producing their own movies because they're unhappy with what's being shown to them in the theaters. They will start to consume what is delivered. That's the part where it's not as clear cut as the free market, the simple, well, it'll work itself out. If you're force fed something and it's something you still want to be part of your life, i.e. entertainment, and this is all you're given, this is the only option you're given, 
If a city is built up out of prefab sheet metal structures, that's all you're given. Unless you go out there and build your own cathedral, unless you go out there and produce your own film, you get what you get. So this is where I look for some balance and where I'll certainly advocate for some balance. The AI is coming, it's already here. We're already seeing the impact on jobs. Yes, that's scary, I understand all that. The best way we can resist it is to focus on our art, remember what the A stands for, and as creators, don't be that. Understand that by definition, we are not what the A stands for, so focus on the opposite of that, that humanity, that soul, and at the same time, advocate for the responsibility of the power centers to not embrace AI as a whole because it's an economic replacement. Because just like with architecture, we will find ourselves at some point in the future surrounded not by beauty and not by artistic creation, but by what came easiest. And that would be sad. All righty. Once again, we're talking Thanks, with PJ Auckland. We're talking about dialects and accents and any question you have on that, like, how do you do that? Throw it in the chat room right now. We'll get to it in just a minute. But right now we're going to take a break and we'll be right back with PJ Auckland right here on VoiceOver Body Shop. So don't go away. This is Bill Ratner and you're enjoying VoiceOver Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Widom. V-O-B-S dot TV. Oh, hi. You know, if you live in a house and your VoiceOver studio is in that house, you don't want to disturb everybody else who's living in there. So what you need are good headphones that are made specifically for voiceover. And that's why we have Harlan Hogan's signature series, Voice Optimized Headphones 2.0. What's so great about these? Well, one, they have a very flat response, so you only hear exactly what it is you sound like. Second, incredibly comfortable. Leather, leather pads on the outside filled with memory foam, a really comfortable headband that really... It really works with your head. The most important thing, you can wear them for long periods of time. That's really important. Where do you get them? Only at voiceoveressentials.com. That's voiceoveressentials.com. Just go there, look at the headphones, and get them now. Tell them we sent you. Thanks, Harlan. Well, it's my chance to talk about Source Elements and actually, I think it's, I've got something different to talk about for the, a change, right? They finally re announced a new version of Source Nexus. And why that's interesting to a voice actor, it just gives uh, sessions a new way to run and a new way that you can be brought into a session. But not only that, if you ever wanted to host your own show, if you ever want to do podcasts, things like this, there are features built into Nexus now that make running your own show or podcast better than ever as well, because it not only gives great quality audio connections between you and your guests, but it also locally captures the audio for the show and uploads the files to you afterwards. So you've got the raw audio in the best possible quality. And that all works through what's called the Source Nexus Gateway. So it's a very interesting new take on Source Connect. There is going to be a roadmap going where Source Nexus and the gateway and the portal and all these different features all start to have a giant mind meld and create a very cohesive system. But for now, Source Connect 3.9 is still the one that voice actors need to have access to, learn how to use, and just be familiar. So head over to source-elements.com and get Source Connect going on your system today so you are ready for the big gigs when they come along because they are the ones that tend to use Source Connect standard in your home studio. Thanks for listening. We got a lot more to talk about with PJ Oakland just coming up right after this. Well, hey there, it's David H. Lawrence with VO Heroes. And wouldn't it be cool if there was a very simple tool, drag and drop tool that would guarantee that the audio you need to upload to ACX or any other audiobook platform is perfectly set up in terms of the tech standards, the root mean square normalization, the peak normalization, the noise floor. Guess what? There is. And I want you to have it absolutely free. It's called Audio Cupcake. And you can find it at audiocupcake.com. I helped create this software. It was built to my specs and my standards for when I do audiobooks. 
and I know it's going to work for you. Now, it's only available for Macintosh uh, because you Windows users, you have the ability to use other tools that work for you. But in this case, you edit your final raw WAV file for a chapter, you drop it onto Audio Cupcake, and out comes the 192K mono MP3 file you can upload immediately. That's audiocupcake.com. Audiocupcake.com. I hope you love it. You're still watching VLBS? <laughs> we're talking with PJ Auckland. We're talking about we're talking about dialects, which is what he teaches over at uh, it is uh, www.drdialect.com. Uh, and uh, you can go over there and see all the stuff that he does. And if you want to take some coaching on how to do that, he's the guy to talk to. Now, George, you had a question uh, in the last half hour about uh, the quality of audiobook publishing. What was what, yeah. what, you, what was that? It seems that there's the the quality of audio that's released in audiobook publishing has stagnated and not really changed or improved. Yeah. Well, since I've known about the industry, really, to be honest, maybe fifteen years. Do you do you see a roadmap to where that's going to change? Um, you know, I'm a little concerned because AI voices are so clinically perfect and yeah. absolutely what you know that I th I'm, a, I'm a little bit afraid that people will get so used to hearing these like absolutely sterile clear perfectly recorded audio samples of ai voice that you know the real recordings will become kind of outmoded do you do you see any end of evolution happening in that area i do see evolution however one aspect you said that I don't know that I'm entirely on board with is has to do with that that perfection of AI. I don't see as a positive. No, I don't. I don't mean it as a positive okay. either. I'm just afraid that people will get used to this overly sterile po the thing, and then yeah. I've, I've actually heard somebody say that I that I listen to a lot. He was another a, a journalist essentially, mm -hmm. who says that I like AI books on certain topics because I can listen to them at two x. <laughs> and hear everything they are saying. Right. And that's a totally different that's a yeah. different thing from performing. That exactly. is that's just pumping data into someone's brain exactly as quickly as possible and that's what some people are looking for. But I mean, I, I, not to distract with the AI comment, but I just feel like uh there's some room to go. Are we talking production value? Just those sound like the fidelity yeah. of the audiobook production <laughs> itself, like a uh, on HD version or a okay. higher res version. Sure. I mean, one thing I think you've seen, one of the advents in the audiobook industry that changed things a lot, and of course, this is across the board with VO, not just audiobooks, but especially with audiobooks, is the prevalence of the home studio narrator and the prevalence of ACX, the Audiobook Creation Exchange, which is uh, a subsidiary of Amazon. So you've got the Amazon ACX Audible triumvirate, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that brought about the more, I hate to use the word amateur because a lot of pros, including me, we produce on ACX because often that's the platform we're using to release books we're doing for independent authors and so on. So it's not across the board amateur. But when I started teaching, you know, like when I co-founded the Dion Institute uh, with Deb Dion, which was right after Bob Dion had passed, and I do all, all of our classes, we do like the audiobook introductory intensive, for example. And when I first started teaching that intro class, I would bring up, we we're doing it in person at the Dion Studios. Now almost everything's virtual, but uh, I would bring up on the screen ACX and we'd see, and there was there were so few producers and the producers on ACX are the narrators, uh, but you have a producer account because on ACX, you're responsible for delivering retail ready audio, uh, as opposed to you're just narrating for a publisher or, or another production company. You are the producer on ACX. And uh, that number was tiny. And now it's gigantic. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are signed up with ACX producer accounts. And um, with that in mind, obviously a huge percentage of those are not professionals. And in terms of passing the audio quality standards to get an independent book released through the ACX platform, you just have to hit mastering marks and mm -hmm. it's going to get released. That's it. So there's no additional vetting that floods the market with a lot of things that are subpar in terms of production value. And also, again, the advent of home studio is you've got a lot of situations where most of these home studios, it's not like everyone's going in and recording on a Neumann U87 and a beautiful you know, booth set up in a professional environment. So that obviously is quite different. But there's also the practicality 
of the audiobook market. There is only so much a publisher can feasibly invest in the production of an audiobook. And I mean, even the big five, you know, when they're doing several thousand books a year each, many of those books they're producing, but they know they're not going to be money makers, even remotely. So there is a consideration for budget that they want to get them in under a certain bar to make it even viable to produce. And many they choose not to produce an audio because they don't think it'll even reach that bar even on a bare bones type of a budget. Mm -hmm. So those practicalities have to be brought in as well. In terms of evolution, I think we're seeing a lot more in terms of multicast production, full soundscape, fully produced audio dramas, the ones that merit that and the publisher, the production company believe this is going to be a worthwhile endeavor. You see more of that now and the quality of those uh, are really, really fantastic. So, so I guess the, it's ultimately the audio drama the is now but, starting to be audio dramas are starting to be released under the umbrella of the audiobook publishing sure. world. All of the publishers now have their audible audio originals. You know, Audible was I think the first one to say Audible originals, but now all the publishers have their originals arm and they're doing things that aren't necessarily traditional books and they're doing a lot of things that are being written specifically for audio. This mm -hmm. is a an audio play, if you will, perhaps yeah. from traditional authors, but totally brought into existence for the sole purpose of, of audio production uh, and not to be released in a text form. So you're seeing more and more of this, even from the traditional publishers. I just did one of those with Simon and Schuster. Um, uh, PRH, Penguin Random House is doing a bunch of those. Um, so it's, it's happening more and more. Obviously, Audible has been in that game for a while. Yeah. And that's bridging the gap between the podcasting, the fictional podcasting world and the traditional audiobook world. And I guess it ultimately comes down to the difference between what we might think of as a very small film festival indie entry yeah. and a summer blockbuster. Mm -hmm. That's going to exist in, in every craft. It exists in movies. And I think that's going to exist with the audiobook world as well in all yeah. the different iterations. That's good All to right. know. I want I want to check out some of those finished products that, of that that you've worked on, and maybe they're impressive. Post, uh, some links to some of those in the end of the show, we can uh, yeah. check them out because I'd like to listen to them just for out of fascination, as being more of a tech than a book reader myself. That's yeah. most of my own library, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I'm definitely can, very interested in hearing how those productions sound and how they're produced and stuff, and. Because I, you know, my job as a technologist like Dan's is to is to really raise the quality of everybody's home studio. Right. And if they're getting confused all the time with, well, all I have to do is hit these uh, marks on the the RMS and the noise floor, and I'm good, right? Exactly. I'm always pushing people to move beyond those basics. Yeah. As as you should. And I think you're providing a huge service by doing that because that was exactly my point. When the threshold is simply oh, it hits the mastering specs. Well, yeah. that doesn't mean the quality of the production is high, you know? Right, right. Yeah. It all depends on what it sounds like. There you go. And does it sound what it's supposed to sound like? Uh, we got a question here from Fiber Jazz. He says, for PJ, if I wanted to work, say, on a French accent, would you want me to already know French? I mean, speaking English with a French accent? No. Not not necessary at all. Sometimes it can come in handy because if you if you speak the other language, the source language of the accent we're working on, that can help in terms of like for French, if you already speak the language, je l'ai étudié à l'université depuis deux années seulement. I already have an understanding of where that placement is, so I I'm comfortable there, or I might understand the French R rouge rouge. Um, and I understand where that comes from. That can help, but not only is it not necessary because we don't need any of the French words for doing the accent on English. That's number one. And number two, I've actually had situations where I work with someone who does speak the language. They're coming to me to learn how to apply the language to English because they don't have experience mm -hmm. keeping the accent from the language on English. And uh, sometimes it's really hard for them because they can't separate the accent from the language. So that's it's not a always point. a benefit even. Uh, that's a good and point. If you that. grew up learning and speaking French, then you learn English from an American teacher or whatever, you're going to speak English with an American accent. You're not going to speak it with a French accent. At least More than likely, depending on the uh, age you learned it at. Yeah. True, the age, yeah. yeah the age is everything. Weird, weird glitch of the brain or one of the aspects 
Um, this, by the way, fun fact for anybody, like when you're deciding should this character have an accent or not, it's right around puberty. Uh, if you move to the new location and you acquire that language prior to puberty, there's a hard wiring in the brain that happens right around 12, 13 ish. Mm -hmm. And we've probably all had that experience where you might meet a couple of siblings and the older sibling has an accent. They sound like they just moved here yesterday, a really heavy accent. And their younger sibling sounds like they were born and raised down the street. And you can do a little bit of like accent sleuthing there and say, I'm thinking when your family moved here, you were like 15 and you were about seven. Like, how did you know that? And it's like, it's that giveaway because there's that cutoff point. And uh, we see that all the time. That person who moved here at 15, they could be in America for 25 years and sound like they did the day they stepped off the plane. Oh, that makes so much sense. Cause I listened to my, my girlfriend's got five siblings, all not in the US. She's lived here 15 years but she's got one of the strongest accents out of all of her siblings. And, um, you know, I'm thinking it's in a lot of them don't, none of them live in the U S right. They're, they're all overseas. So, um, that is really fascinating actually. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. It really yeah. is amazing. How it works. It's really like flipping a switch, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. you've got the next question, George right. from Ron M. Ron M. Uh, PJ, where do you, uh, where do we find your training? What is your uh, training site again? That's, Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, for any private coaching, drdialect.com. You can reach out to me. My information's on there. I'm very easy to get a hold of. Busy, but I'll certainly get back to you. Um, so my email's on there, and there's contact form as well if you prefer that, but that's drdialect.com, drdialect.com. Since you mentioned the busy part, I mean, all of us find ways to make time for different aspects. How do you determine how much of your time you de de dedicate to coaching versus working on book projects? You know, it's a great question, and I just don't know that I have a decent answer. It just yeah. always works out. You okay. know, I mean, you, you start to book out, you know, sometimes you book out farther, and sometimes you have more immediate availability. It depends. I've been taking on less recording work, um, I guess, just in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of that is just, I'm happy with the current sort of balance, um, yeah. and some of it is just the demand for the producing time and the coaching time. Um, the other, I'll parlay this into a second answer to the other question, which is the other site is Dion Institute, Dion spelled D-E-Y-A-N, institute.com. And we have a wildly popular, the masterclass series that we do, has nothing to do with dialects. This is where mm -hmm. the performance coaching side of things comes in. And um, every, every, week. It's an every other week thing. We do a series, a season of six guests and I'm your lead coach and host. And I have with me a, a special guest who's a casting director or publisher, or producer from the industry, decision makers who all bring, you know, different aspects. Some of them work as directors, some of them work only in casting, some of them work only in producing, some of them work as engineers, but they're all decision makers on casting as well. And the insights they bring, I let them take the lead on directing pieces. Everybody reads a piece. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's, it's so meaningful. And that's what really excites me. It really is incredibly meaningful. Everybody who does it, the letters I get, you guys wouldn't believe. Uh, it's just, it's made such an impact and it's so rewarding. It's so gratifying that things like that start to make up a big part of my schedule because we do two seasons per year now. And each one is 18 classes because I'm doing three nights oh, with wow. each guest just to fulfill the demand. And that's as much as we can go because I can't ask them to do a fourth night. It's already crazy. And they sell out in like two hours. No joke. It's like 360 slots or something. But they're so good. And mm. it means so much to me that it's having such a positive impact that you know, that, that changes things. Like I want to put effort into that because it's making a difference. And if that takes away a little bit of time from my narrating, I'm okay with that at this point in my career. So somehow I just juggle it and it, and it works, you know? Um, yeah. And then there's, if anybody wants, there's the, uh, the, uh, the character voice toolbox, which is my seven P's. Um, the tools that I use again, the who's more important than the what, but nonetheless, I've had books, I've had series where each book has upwards of 150, 200 characters, and I'm trying to keep them all unique from each other. And in the series, you're exceeding a thousand characters in five or seven books. And these are the tools I use to try and make sure that the nine different bartenders and the eight different posses and the eight different bandit gangs in the Western <laughs> all kind of sound unique. And uh, that 
is the first half. The second half is the how to be your own dialect coach thing. I do that live once a year, but it's available as a video. So that's on the uh, the website, on the Dr. Dialect website too. So I think that's really useful. It's like three and a half hours of instruction. Uh, so I highly recommend that if anybody is looking to acquire those skills and has use for them in their VO career. All right. We got time for a question, maybe two. Uh, Larry Oblander the Seconds asks, I missed a lot already, but do you recommend for learning or practicing dialects on your own? What do I recommend for practicing on your own? Is, is that the yeah. question? Yes. Um, the thing I just mentioned, I mean, totally self-promotion, but the how to be your own dialect coach, I think is, is huge because um, it's so hard to know what to look for. If you don't have experience or have worked with a dialect coach, you need to first figure out what am I listening for? What am I looking for? So I break down the key aspects of the phonetics, the concept of placement, how to acquire placement, where to look for it, how to execute, you know? Um, that's where I think it comes in really handy. Understanding even basics, like not just the phonetics, but also how significant understanding of a schwa is. If you guys remember from school, the upside down backwards E symbol, it's all over the place in English. And sometimes understanding whether your speaker, your accented speaker knows what that is and understands it is going to affect their accent on the English. So I go through all that kind of stuff. When you have that kind of a handle, then hopefully it equips you to go out, listen to resources through places like YouTube, through places like Paul Myers Dialects Archive, through places like George Mason University, the um, uh, accents.gmu. Uh, uh, is that the one? Yeah, close to that. I might be misstating it, but that's the George Mason University one. These are wonderful uh, resources, but you got to know what to do with them. Just having a database of the accents, mimicry will get you pretty far, but not typically far enough if you don't know what you're listening for. So that's where like really capitalizing on the, um, the most significant sound changes that separate that accent from another. I think that's a big deal. All right. George, you had one last question there. Well, yeah. What did, uh, what are the, what do you feel like is like the strongest conference? There's so many conferences now, but for <laughs> people that are really focused on audiobook narrating, what do you think is the best resource for them on the conference level? On the conference level, if you're, if it's about audiobook narrating specifically, APAC, the Audio Publishers Association Conference, hands down. That's the one mm -hmm. because it's not just about the learning that comes from the panels and so on, but it's also when you do a conference, Let's be honest, part of your reason for attending and participating is you're networking and you're looking to meet the people who are in a position to hire you. You want to get jobs. You don't just want to learn about the craft. You want to get gigs. APAC, I think, delivers more than any other in that regard because it is entirely audiobook focused and because it gets the most participation from the publishers and the production companies who can cast you. So if that's your goal, that's an easy answer. All righty. Well, PJ, thanks so much for being with us. This was a very informative hour. And once again, where can people find you? What's your website? It's uh, for coaching purposes, drdialect.com or my name, pjoakland.com is my personal site. But I think I'm, I'm pretty easy to find on all the social. It's just at PJ Oakland. Reach out. I, I really am always happy to hear from people. And if I can help, I promise I'm glad to. All righty. Thanks for being with us. This has been great. Thank you, guys. It's great to see you, too. Thanks, thanks for having me. All right, we'll run into each other probably in Gelson's or something. All right, we'll be right back to wrap things up and re rack it for Tech Talk right after this, so do not go away. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. There's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products, and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. VoiceOver Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions, bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, home studio setup, and 
and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. All right, it's time for my little talk about voiceactor.com. That's voiceactor.com. What is voiceactor.com? Well, voiceactor.com is a website where you can create your own voice actor website. And, you know, it's important that you have a website. Uh, at, at World Voices, when we're trying to determine whether you are a professional or not to qualify to be a professional, you got to have a website. If you're a professional voice actor, you got to have a website. It is your business card with the stuff that makes you what you are, which is your name, your demos, which are really important, and how to get a hold of you. And sometimes trying to put a website together is very, very hard if you really don't know how to code and do all this other stuff. Voiceactor.com has made it incredibly simple for you. All you do is you go in there, you sign up, create an account, and set up is free. Yes, it's absolutely free to set up your initial website with a template. Templates make it super easy. There are different layouts and different different color schemes. You can change the colors. You can change the background pictures. You can do anything you want, and it's all very simple, menu-driven, not code-driven. So go over to voiceactor.com and get your voice actor website up in no time. I mean, really quick. Not only that, you can use it for other types of websites as well. And then for $20 a month, you get your own URL and it will be, it'll be on a server and that will be your voice actor website. Go over to voiceactor.com right now and get your website up and running ASAP. We are the World Voices Organization, also, also known, known as WOVO. We're the not-for-profit industry association of freelance voice talent. VoiceOver is a complex entrepreneurial business. WOVO is there to promote the professional nature of voice work to the public, to those already established in their voiceover practice, and to those who want to pursue voiceover as a career. Membership benefits include a supportive and creative community, community. a profile and demos on voiceover.biz, our searchable directory of vetted professional voice talent, our exclusive demo player for your personal website. Our mentoring program, business resources, and our video library. Our annual WovoCon conference, a fun and educational weekend with other members with, with the a chance, chance to learn, learn and, and network. network. Webinars and great speakers and weekly social chats with other members around the world. If your world is voiceover, make Wovo part of it. World Voices Organization. We, we speak, speak for those who speak, speak for a living. living. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. All righty. We're back here at Voice Over Body Shop. We're going to re-rack it for Tech Talk here in a second. And we're glad uh, that you joined us tonight. And uh, our thanks again to PJ Auckland teaching us about doing dialects. Go on over to his website and check him out. And maybe if you want to learn how to do it better, he's the guy to talk to. All righty. Next week on this very show. If you happen to be in this same place next week, you come on to Facebook or our Facebook or our website or LinkedIn or wherever our podcast that's on Podbean, uh, you will hear and watch Tech Talk number 113, which we are about to record. If you happen to be watching live, don't go anywhere because we got another hour of great stuff that you do not want to miss. Uh, and in two weeks, we've got a great uh, coach who teaches promo. And we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a couple of weeks. So make sure you join us for that one. Uh, you've got discounts for your uh, your people that go over to uh, yep, georgeD.tech. It's amazing how many of my clients know. I know they know about this show. I know they've seen the show, but they don't use the coupon code. What are they thinking? Go to <laughs> georgeD.tech slash VOBS for our coupon code for discounts on video uh, videos. We've got a huge... Huge library, always growing, of uh, recorded content now. Webinars and modules, things that are longer, shorter, all different topics that are going to help you with your home studio if you want to go check that out. But use the 
get that passcode. I mean, get that uh, coupon code, guys. Come there on. it is. Easy. V-O-B-S Fan 10. All righty. And now we need to talk about our donors of the week. You can become a donor. Uh, make sure that this show continues on technically perfect when the director's here. And, hey, uh, you did a darn good job. You really did. That's it's, not easy to juggle all those it, things. It's it's going back and forth. It reminds me of my radio days with video. Anyway. Well, in, the, in, the, in the radio days, you had a console with all these buttons on it. You're just doing all this with a mouse. Yeah. Click, click, All right. Click. Well, anyway, you can become a donor to the show. And uh, here are some of the people that have done it, like Greg Cooper. Grace Newton. Christopher Epperson. Robert Leadham. Stephen Chandler. Casey Clack. Jonathan Grant. Thomas Pinto. Greg Thomas. A Doctor Voice. Antland Productions. Martha Kahn. Feel Better Martha 949 Designs. Sarah Borges. Philip Sapir. Brian Page. Rob Ryder. Shauna Pennington Baird. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Uh, Diana Birdsall. Maria Mackis. And Sandra Manwiller. Also, join our mailing list. All you have to do is go to our website, uh, vobs.tv, and down at the bottom it says subscribe to our newsletter. Mm -hmm. So you know who's going to be on the show this week. Anyway, uh, also we need to thank our sponsors, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. VOHeroes.com. VoiceActor.com. And and WorldVoices.org, the industry association of freelance voice talent already. Now I got to find the, the other thing that I got to put up here, which is our email address, which is the guys at VOBS.TV. You can email us a question at any time during the week. And if you email us, guess what? You get to be first in line. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's not a matter of, you know, all you have to do is email us, say, Hey, I got a question, a tech question for you. And then we'll answer it. And not Simple you know have to that. wait exactly or be, that's right it's all free we're giving you all this free information I mean for crying out loud mm-hmm. anyway which well I gotta hide that one there we go all right so coming up next is tech talk if you got a question for us throw it in the chat room right now if you're watching live you get to interact with us if you're watching this in replay oh well but you're still gonna get lots of great information so anyway. Look, this is not an easy business. Voiceover requires training and and knowing how to run a business and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. But we've discovered that if you're recording right, if it sounds good. It is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Stay tuned for Tech Talk. 